Well, I've been following your stuff for, for quite a while now on, on the internet through podcasts and social media. Yeah. And it seems like you've had literally the craziest fucking life <laughs> <laughs> I have ever seen, you know. Yeah. Um, and like how you've gone through that and managed to negotiate and that now, you know, be doing something really good through writing books and talking Thanks. to school kids, I find like really in- inspirational and amazing. Yeah. Um, but I guess the sort of image in my mind I'll conjure up of if someone told me, you know, someone went to America, was a massive drug dealer, went to the maximum security prison, yeah. they would conjure up a certain childhood that they went through. But was, was that accurate in your case or like what was your childhood? Like how did it all start? Living with prisoners was the best education in psychology possible and hearing about their childhoods, thrown away as kids, raised on the streets, some were molested, some had seen parents murdered, a lot of them have been traumatised and that's why they've got into drugs. In prison these days it's the criminalisation of addiction, the vast majority of people, low level drug users. So I would say that my childhood was starkly different to those. I was raised in a family who, no abuse, encouraged my further education, really supported me to go on to university and to be a successful person. And I saw, you know, people disowned because they got involved in drugs, disowned by their families. And my family flew 5,000 miles to come visit me. Nearly every year I had people coming over from England. Wow. So you, you said about the further education, so you, was it a... Uh... A business degree or something you went and did? Yeah, I did A levels, maths, physics, economics, and S level economics. That was my expertise was economics. That's what I scored the highest in. And then I went on to do a business studies degree. When I was a kid, I was also computer programming, so I wasn't sure where I was going to go stock market or into like programming computer games. But in the end, the stock market thing took over. Yeah, and so how did you get into the stock market? Well. When I was 14, my economics teacher, Mr. Dillon, started to give me classes on my own because he saw how interested in in it I I was. And then he showed me the Financial Times, explaining all the columns of the numbers, what all the prices mean and what all the ratios mean. I'm looking at the charts. And then at 16, I borrowed some money off my nan, 50 quid, and doubled it right away in British Telecom (laughs) shows. So I'm telling everyone, then in my little town, you know, yeah, yeah. Now I'm like, like this little entrepreneur, I'm going to go to America and make a million, fly yeah. everybody over. That was my, that was my goal from that, that age. Wow. So you sort of had that, that ambition from a very, very young age. And what was yeah. it? Your goal was to make money or to be, or to be something? What was the goal? To make a million by the time I was 30 was my goal. Because back then I had to set goals, you know, I'm going to yeah, do this yeah, within yeah. this many years. These days I just wake up and go with the flow. But yeah. back then I was very goal orientated. Yeah, yeah. And that, that sort of that million was the the Super Bowl at the end of all the training yes. or whatever it was for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, how did that end up transpiring to you going to the USA? Why didn't you look at the stock markets and go to the British stock markets? What was so good about the USA? Coming from the northwest of England and visiting America as a kid, you know, you see all the swimming pools in the backyards and the planes coming to land. Yeah, yeah. But here, the English accent, they roll out the red carpet. Yeah. My aunt changed my date of birth in my passport when I was 16. So I was 21, so I could go nightclubbing. Really? <laughs> introduced, me, introduced me to all these beautiful American women as Paul McCartney's nephew. <laughs> so imagine, you're a nobody from the northwest. Suddenly, you're Paul McCartney's nephew in a foreign yeah. country, and all the women are like, ooh, like this. So, that motivated me to get out of the... Wow, that is... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're from being this kid in a small town to being Paul McCartney's <laughs> yeah. nephew. Um, and even when I wasn't Paul McCartney's nephew, whenever they heard the English accent, they just rolled out the red carpet, oh, your accent's so cool. Yeah, Where yeah, are yeah. you from in England and all this stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like you almost thought you could live a glamorous life and people would respect you out there, I guess, and you could become a millionaire. Like, it, almost like living the American dream. It was. It was like you almost had like a bit of a celebrity status. Mm-hmm. And then over time, as I built myself up in the scene, the rave scene, I'd be, they would call me the Bank of England and English Sean. It just got bigger and bigger and it just fed my ego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's um so did you grow up? Um so what was your first encounter with drugs I guess and why did you get into drugs? How did that all come in? 
So my very first encounter with drugs was when some kid had weed at our school. And I didn't smoke because I saw my grandfather die. He smoked and he got lung cancer and stuff and it spread throughout his body and his skin turned green. Yeah. Um, so my first experience with drugs was the rave scene, when the rave scene began in this country because prior to the rave scene you had to stand in a line at a nightclub, you had to be nicely dressed and the bouncers would come out and just look at you like you were scum and maybe they'd let you in and maybe they wouldn't. Mm. And the young people were sick of that. So they just started to break into warehouses, airplane hangers, wearing what the hell clothes they wanted, all these crazy colours, big old sneakers, and then just dancing all night long to house music and yeah, yeah. and taking ecstasy. And the police, there was like literally convoys in the middle of the night on the motorways of 10,000 ravers. And the police yeah. couldn't <laughs> do anything about it. There was just too many people yeah. for them to police. So they just watch him go off to these fields or go into these warehouses and um, it was like a crisis in the country because then there was a backlash and the government was like, we've got to stop all of this, you know, and started to try and clamp down on it. Yeah, yeah. So you was, you was into the rave scene before you moved to America? I got into the rave scene in this country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you sort of took that, that idea over there? Or was, that, was it already there? In America... It takes time for European musical influences to filter in. So in the beginning, it will come into America, for example, into New York. Mm. It'll come in L.A. on the other side of the country. And then it'll filter into the other states. So Arizona was running quite a few years behind in the rave scene. When I got there, there was all these little cliques competing against each other. But they started to come to me for the money to invest in their parties and their schemes. And I, they called me the Bank of England, and I would then, <laughs> I unified all these little cliques then under the structure of a corporation. So right, right. each faction had a head, and we'd have like a crime family dinner every so often. Yeah. So on, you know, it got to the point where I had about 200 people working for me. My, my competitor was Sammy de Bulgravano in the XC market. Wow, well, wow. Well. Yeah. So you took your, your business acumen and your sort of go to attitude to make this. <laughs> Almost like an empire on your thing, yeah. In the beginning, I was showing off, buying everybody drugs. And when you give drugs away for free, you attract a lot of friends. And that was yeah. feeding my ego. Yeah. And then I saw the business potential of quitting working in the stock market and just making a full-time job of being in ecstasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, did, did you quit? Or was you running like a simultaneous um, life? at the time. Was, was you still working the stocks while you was doing? I quit working as a stockbroker to go full time into the rave scene. Right, okay. But I did trade my own account online yeah. during the dot com bubble and that's when that shot up to about two million. Wow, wow, yeah. wow. So you, you achieved your aim way earlier than you thought then? Just slightly before 30, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, how did you become so big, <laughs> I guess? So you, you, in you, stock market or in drugs? In in, well, I guess yeah. Maybe let's talk about the stock market and then move on to the drugs because you um you moved out there and I guess you must have. Did you did you know anyone when you moved out there? Or was it just you went off? I didn't know anyone. I just had my aunts. Yeah, yeah. And I quickly got my own apartment near where I worked, and I just built everything up from there on my own. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how how did you how did you do that? What what is the stock market like? Well, in the beginning, you make friends with your colleagues that you're working with. And there was another rookie guy who was doing really well. He was opening a lot of accounts, and I partnered up with him. Mm -hmm. If you've watched my Bank of Broad episode, it shows me and him. And we get, because we're working these long hours then, you know, we want to let that stress out of our system. So he starts to introduce me to like local clubs that are starting to bring the rave scene in. Yeah. And that's how I first got into ecstasy consumption in America. But the stockbrokers are heavy coke and heavy crystal meth users because right, right. anything that's going to keep you awake and yeah. on the phone all day is going to boost your business because we had to be in at five in the morning sales. Sorry, I'm up, I'm up at five in the morning for the six o'clock in the morning sales meeting. Wow. Some days I was on the phone from six in the morning till nine or ten at night in the beginning as a rookie broker. It's commission only. Wow. And I wasn't even getting paid. You don't get paid unless you're opening accounts and doing trades. Yeah, so the, the, the onus is on you to exactly. make that money. Yeah. Now, you asked earlier about how did it get big. Yeah. Things have got big in my life, I believe, because I have this manic energy. 
if I am enthused about something, yeah, I will throw this manic energy into it. So, for example, now I'm enthused about writing. Yeah. So I'll wake up, cook my breakfast, get on my computer, and some days I won't stop writing until 10, 11 at night, just right before I'm going to go to bed. Yeah. I'm capable of doing that. Yeah. I don't clock in and clock out. I'll just throw, throw everything in it. Yeah. It's not healthy because I've managed to uh, damage my back and I've had to have some therapies and treatments and stuff. Well, so, through, so through writing. Yeah, yeah. I go to, I take everything to an extreme in my life. Yeah. And it causes you harm. You can tell, yeah. It causes <laughs> yeah. harm. I, yeah. I had a trapped nerve in my neck. Yeah. There was one month, I had a deadline on my, my first Pablo Escobar book and I just stopped all exercise completely and wrote for a month straight. Wow. I ended up with almost a trapped nerve. I'm sorry, almost a frozen shoulder and then trapped nerve in my, in my neck. Wow. Yeah, and that got to the point where every few hours in my sleep I was waking up in pain. I could only sleep in so many positions. Jesus. So I had to then address this thing inside me that I've got. Yeah. After going through prison, I looked back at the mistakes I made previously. Yeah. But I had to do that again because, yeah, I'm not taking things to an extreme illegally. I'm taking things to an extreme, it's legal, but I'm still hurting myself. Yeah, yeah. So now I have to take time out. Uh, you know, I do all my yoga, I make sure I do all my yoga. I'm doing swimming now because it's so good for your shoulders and so yeah. good for your back. Yeah. Um, I'm doing all this all this stuff, um, strike force, like this boot camp class, a right. bit of body combat. Got to keep, got to keep moving, haven't you? Because if you sat at your computer all day, you're really doing yourself in. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, yeah it's really interesting. I, I think, like, for me, exercise has been really good, especially for mental health stuff, like you're saying. Yeah. It's like manic energy. I think I can definitely... Um, sort of feel what what you're saying now I'm, I'm very similar maybe not to as an extreme level as yeah. you may be but yeah I'm, you know whenever i'm into something it's almost like everything else goes out the window and i'm doing that you know so yeah. i totally understand what, you, what you're, you're just saying. like me then yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So when i was joining the army i was joining the army and i was going to be the best soldier there was yeah you know, when i was getting out i wanted to be the best civil there was and when i want to do a podcast i want to be the best one you know <laughs> <laughs> just like all these things like yeah, yeah. I, was, like, I totally understand um, i think we'll always have it in us but we learn to temper it and understand it more yeah it's strange like looking back because i've had to do a lot of looking back at you know, going through my life and realizing why I do certain things I do, and it is interesting looking back and figuring that stuff out. Like, um, so I stopped exercise. So when I got out of the army, it's like I almost wanted to just leave the whole thing behind. Yeah. So I stopped doing all my fitness, and I was very fit in the army. I was like known for being really fit. Um, and only recently I took it back on. But like, the, even the first run I did, I was instantly thinking, right, I'm gonna do a marathon. I'm gonna try to do this time in a marathon. Like, yeah. Day day one. <laughs> 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 so I think it's just something you know in certain people's brains that you just. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Maybe a competitiveness or something. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So that took you to become a millionaire in the stock market. That energy, applying that energy, being on the phone all day long. Uh, within five years, I was the top producer in the office, and within ten years, I was living in a million dollar house on the side of a mountain with my own two million dollar portfolio of, of shares, yeah. and running this huge illegal drug business. Yeah. So. <laughs> So at what point then did you think, um, you know, you, you're a millionaire living on the side of this amazing, living in an amazing place with a swimming pool. Yeah. What made you then risk that? Or did you even see it as a risk to start doing the drugs or to continue doing the drugs? Or risk just... risk analysis when you're taking drugs is not easy from the perspective of drugs scramble your decision making processes, but you don't know that it's happening. Right. So you think you're behaving completely normally and rationally, mm. but over 10 years of drug use, you've gone so far over that slippery <laughs> slope, yeah. and you've surrounded yourself with people who are also doing the same thing and reinforcing each other's insane behavior, yeah. that it leads to disaster. I always had that business acumen, which enabled things to get so big, but my behavior and the behavior of my friends got to the point where you know it was, it was really attracting police attention mm. yeah um so wh while you was doing this then so you was this there must have been sort of like drug scenes and people that were big players that you know ha handed down through like you, you see films like the goodfellas the mafia yeah. they handed down this people have to go through a rank structure and build the way up and it seems like you yeah. just come on this scene and all of a sudden you was there and you was making a shit ton of money living <laughs> on the side of a, of a hill. Was, was there anyone out there like, trying to stop you? In the beginning, I had the Arizona rave scene, the XC market pretty much locked down. Yeah. For quite a few years, but then when Sammy the Bulls crew moved in, 
they had all these big steroid head jocks yeah. selling pills. And this gang called the Devil's Dogs, who when they were attacking people, they would all yelp and bark like dogs. Jesus. Yeah, so things got ugly when his people started to move into the scene. And, it, and my top sales guy, his name was Skinner. He was selling a lot of stuff for me. Sammy the Bulls crew lured him into a nightclub to do a deal, got him into the toilet, knocked his teeth out and took all of his pills and all of his money. Yeah. And I got scared after that. I thought, all right, I'm going to move now out of Phoenix. And I moved oh, 100, and, 100 or so miles to Tucson right. and got a house in a mountain in a gated, guarded community where you couldn't even get up the street. Yeah. Well, there was a guard there and a barrier and the guard had to call the house and get permission for you to let that vehicle up to the street into the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it got, it got, started to dark, the dark side started to unfold. And how long into it, what did, was it when that happened? The glitz and the glamour and everything was for about three, four, three years or so. Yeah. And then there was about two years of dark stuff. Right, right. Until the SWAT team came. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for that three years, just, what what did it feel like? You must was it like you felt on top of the world? Did you feel him? <laughs> that feeling, being a character in the scene, yeah. running a illegal business of about two hundred people, party for up to ten thousand people. Your bouncers are running around. You think you're the man, and um, you know beautiful women are coming up to you all night long, thanking you for the XC pills and in, in the VIP area and all this stuff. That attention is more addictive than the cash and the drugs. Right, right. I went from being the shy student in the UK to suddenly this character in the scene. Yeah. And I'm larger than life now. And even with Pablo Escobar, his brother said to him, you know, we've got so much money, why don't we just buy our own island and retire? Mm. And he said, I'm running this huge business. I've got all these people working for me, all this power. Yeah, yeah. What, and you want me to kick back on a deck chair, sipping a, a, a cool <laughs> drink? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is more powerful than the cash and the drugs and everything else. Is that feeling? Yeah, so it's almost beyond the money at that point. It is beyond the money? Yeah. I was yeah. worth two million in the stock market. I didn't <laughs> need to be getting doing this yeah, for yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm doing it because it's ego and power and this feeling that I'm this character now in the scene, this, 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 yeah. this, this, this larger than life. I think it goes back when I was a kid. I used to read Marvel comics, you know. Right. So there were all these big larger than life characters. Yeah, like, yeah. Like Iron Man, the Fantastic Four. Yeah. So I was always enamoured, and I think subconsciously I almost felt like you know I had this this attention now and this power. I almost felt like I was close I could possibly be as a human being to being so some, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It sounds really similar to like the military when 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 I was in the military. I almost felt well for the a lot of it. I felt almost invincible. Yes. It was no, nothing to do with the money. Like he wasn't getting paid that much, but it was pretty decent. But probably not enough money to be going out and walking around until you get blown up. But you know, it, yeah. it was just like the the status of it, the the feeling you get when you're walking around in on operations of you know mm -hmm. feeling like you're this like powerful. Yeah. Thing. yeah she, see, I can I can understand that. It must feel so powerful. Like we were like we were above the law. We're never gonna get caught. We always yeah, outsmart yeah. the police. But that was the drugs telling us that. Yeah, yeah, and um. I found as well, like um, what you were saying about the drugs, like after leaving the military and going through this mental health stuff, I'll I'll be going through thinking, oh, I'm fine, I'm 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 dealing with this completely fine. Yeah. And everyone around me is going, you're not fine. You need to go to the doctor. You need to do this. You need to. And yeah. I'm like, what are you talking about? And it got um like even to the stage where I got sent from work to this um uh, what do you call it occupational health thing, mm -hmm. and I sat there speaking to this doctor, and I was like, all right, yeah, see you after like an hour or something. And he sent back this letter, and what it said on the letter was like, you've been diagnosed with PTSD, depression, yeah, anxiety, course. you need to stop drinking immediately. And I was like, Jesus, this is a bit strong. Yeah. And I showed it to my boss, and, it, and um, I was like, this seems a bit strong. And he was like, oh, it seems to make a bit of sense. And I was like, okay. And then I rang my girlfriend, and I was like, have you seen this? This is mad. And she was like, no, it makes sense. So I think it's weird when your brain's not functioning right, you're almost the last person to see it. You're in complete and utter denial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you're just going through like, ah, it's completely fine on top of the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what sort of, 
So one of the main people that I've seen from watching your podcast is Wildman. Wildman. <laughs> <laughs> like he always seems to come up. And like, um, what sort of? How did you meet Wildman? So he was someone from your your. Yeah, your... if you ever read my book Party Time, he's probably the second most character that I write about in that book. Because from childhood we're mates. I was in a little gang, not like an American street gang, just a little gang of kids. Mm called the sweats right. which was which was run by his older brother yeah. who was wicked to him and wouldn't let him join the sweats he'd say look eat dog shit and we'll let you join him make him eat dog shit and then he'd be like fuck you go home right, right. and he would beat the shit out of him and wild man said he couldn't even have a wank with him getting twatted by his brother nah. in his house and then all of a sudden because wild man was about three years younger than his oldest brother but then all of a sudden he just got a huge, yeah. bigger than anyone in his family. And the teachers were kind of wary of him. They put him outside, raking leaves and stuff at the school. He almost got expelled and stuff. But they, they let him just do like caretaking duties. Mm. Um, and I thought, all right, he's going to end up in prison for the rest of his life because he was getting into petty, violent crime. So I thought, when I go to America, I'm going to save him from this. I'm going to have him get a job as a wrestler. Right, okay. Because so, I went over to America begin, thinking I was going to just get a normal job and settle down for the rest of my life, and that was it. Yeah, yeah. And I could get Wildman out and get him as a job as a wrestler. Yeah. It was five, five years after I'd been in the country, the drugs thing started. Um, but none of that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, every time I see... Um, like well, like well, he seems like one of those guys that you don't want to fuck with. But also, it's like I don't know, almost like um, I don't know, almost like a big child in a way. Like he just sort of seems like it's like what you said. You can totally imagine that he went through that horrible childhood, and he's just he's just trying to do things. That it seems like he he does these things and gets into these situations, but he's always doing it from a good place. If you know. That's like. it. Well, man is a very protective person. Yeah. So if you're on his good side. <laughs> You know, he's going to take a bullet for you, or yeah, yeah. if someone's threatening you, he's going to just knock them out like that. He's not even going to think twice. Yeah, I've yeah. seen it. Yeah. You know, people have come up to us and said, so and so's just give me shit, or so and so's just stole something from me, like that. And he, he just, bam, like that. He'll just, yeah, yeah. he'll just take that person out. Yeah. So, yeah, he's, he's, um, he, would be like, he would have been like the king's bodyguard hundreds of years ago. Yeah. But now we classify people like that as psychopaths. Right, right. And a lot of them end up in prison. Yeah, so I right. thought I could channel that aggressive energy into wrestling. But I ended up, you know, he became a scary person working for me. But I didn't have to have him beat people up to get people to pay me. Mm. My favourite thing was just having Wild Man move in with them. Right. <laughs> yeah, because if he moved in with you, within a, a, few, a few days, there would be... People coming over from all kinds of life or areas of life. There'd be like gang members, there'd be Native American transsexuals, <laughs> there, there would be like uh, ravers, yeah. there'd be Russian mafia, Mexican mafia, there'd be someone in the kitchen cooking up crack, all your furniture would be slowly getting sold off. <laughs> and people would generally move out within two to three weeks of wild man moving in. Wow. So all the, all the people who worked for me, who owed me money, knew. If they couldn't pay, there was a good chance Wild Man was going to move in with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, yeah. you know. <laughs> 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 Oh, man. Not to mention all the houses that blew up or got set on fire. Not by him intentionally. By him just on drugs, messing around, doing stuff, and almost getting blown up himself and caught in those fires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got multiple fire stories. I'm, I'm doing a... a Wild Man Fire Story playlist on YouTube. Yeah. He even set fire to prison when he was making tattoo ink. <laughs> <laughs> like a natural arsonist. Um, yeah, so you mentioned so those like the good uh, the good times when you you were throwing rave parties and you felt like you was on top of the world. But then you, you mentioned about it getting dark. So what? Yeah. What was? How did it start turning dark? When you start out taking drugs, the pleasure is extremely high and the pain is very low. Mm. To keep that high going, you're always chasing those first highs. You keep taking drugs, or you increase your drugs, or you mix your drugs up. Yeah. Now that can boost that, that pleasure back, back up again, but over time it keeps going down and keeps going down, and the pain is rising in the background. 
and eventually the, the dark side of it, the, the side effects, the paranoia, um, uh, the, the loss of your mental faculties, all that stuff starts to outweigh the benefits and you, everyone starts to behave more, more erratically, people start to die. Mm. Half of my friends in party time now, the main characters are dead. Oh, yeah. I've lost three in the last year who have continued to take drugs. One was high on Xanax, was walking along, passed out, fell down, hit his head on a countertop. Another one was found foaming at the mouth. Um, he'd been on a drug and alcohol rampage, mm. found dead. And another one actually got busted transporting crystal meth, put in prison. And he had a mole on his skin. And if you've got a medical situation in prison, there's a saying you've got nothing coming. There's two death rows, there's the people who are on death row who are going to condemn to death and there's people who have got serious illnesses, right, they're, going, they're right. just going to die because wow. you're not going to get the treatment. Yeah. So they wouldn't fix his mole and he, he just died a couple of months ago from no um, cancer went f entirely throughout his body skin cancer and that no. is so curable. Yeah, yeah. It's really sad. So yeah, so you go from this, you know, you're taking drugs your first time when the pleasure's high, having the time of your life, which I did, but then by the end of it, at, towards the end of that row, people are dying. People are getting paranoid, uh, the police are coming after us, all of the harsh stuff is, is coming out the woodwork. And what was, was there a certain turning point? You mentioned about um, your, your main seller getting his teeth knocked out, was that kind of the, the turning point for you? My main sales guy getting his teeth knocked out was a heads up, but it was insufficient for me to stop what I was doing. Mm. It was a heads up that I needed to relocate and increase my personal security. Right. I was still addicted to running this business. And in this big house on the mountain now, this million dollar house of a swimming pool and jacuzzi, mm. I was going even higher up the scale of ego. Yeah. Because yeah. now I'm the, the, the Mr. Cool guy living on the mountain. Yeah. So my right hand man would take care of business in Phoenix for me. And then he would drive up to my house and tell me everything that was going on. He had rented an apartment just for the cash. Right. He, knew, he knew where all the drugs were and the cash was. We won't speak on the phone. He's going to come to my apartment. And, um, and I'm sorry, the house on the mountain. And I will delegate the orders from there to him. And then he will tell all the heads of all the different factions what they needed to do. And that's how it was run from me on the mountain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I never used phones, texts, anything like that. If you're drug, what kind of drug dealer is going to do that? Yeah. You're just asking to get arrested. Yeah. So on my video, on, on, uh, when I get released to uh, London Airport there, my sister's showing me her phone, and I've not seen texting before on her phone, she's showing it to me. <laughs> I've seen that, yeah. Yeah, and some people have said, he's lying, he was, te <laughs> was texting when he got arrested. What kind of drug dealer is texting? Yeah, right. That's immediate arrest. <laughs> I banned everybody, but they, a lot of them wouldn't listen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, it's almost like, it sounds like the, the evolution of Scarface. When you watch the film Scarface, he starts yeah. off at a very low rank and then he ends up running stuff from this, this mansion on the hill, right? Scarface took it to the murder level. We never took it to the murder level. There was a lot of beef between people who were working for me and I had to try and like straighten those out.